orders to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish the work he gave me to do. Afternoon, church. It's praise and worship time. And just before we start, as Pastor mentioned, I just want to, if we could give a round of applause in welcoming some new members of Praise Team 4. We have Myla and um, um, Z.A. and Birch, sorry. <laughs> Amen. And I just want to, um, I just want to um, commend them um, because sometimes it's a little harder sometimes to get youth, well, not youth, but teens to be involved. But well, sometimes they don't feel that there's a spot for them to be involved. So I just want to thank them for saying yes right away. There was nothing, no real encouragement, just ask, and they were willing. So praise God for that. And we're going to sing a, a medley of songs. It talks about God and his holiness. He's worthy and he's wonderful. For there's no one else like him. There's no one like God that's faithful and ever true. I pray that you're blessed by the ministry today. So it says, only you. Only you.
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. How great. We used to have a great God. Uh, and I just can't wait to when it's all over and we wear a crown. 
I shall wear a crown. Amen. Amen.
Can we say amen again to praise team number four, blessing our hearts today. Praise God for the new teen additions to this wonderful praise team. Thanks, Mike, for your leadership and our musicians uh, for blessing us here today. Let us pray together, let us pray together, Spirit of the living God. In the wee hours of this morning, you and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now for thy servant is listening. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Say amen again. Lift up before you today, verse 9. Verse 9 of the fourth chapter of the gospel as recorded by John. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, Ask if drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 11 says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Verse 12 says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I have entitled this riveting, prevaricating, and cavernous pericope, the well is deep. The well is deep. Mm. I can remember as a young teenager jumping off of cliffs for the first time into the deep. I remember traveling to, I don't even know what those islands are called, but we would go down the harbor and we would stop at these islands that had very high cliffs and we would jump off the deep. I remember going to Horseshoe Bay and jumping off the highest cliff for the first time and uh, it was something about jumping off the deep, that, that nerve to actually just leap uh, to take the plunge. I remember jumping off of one island and in essence uh, there was a rock right out in the middle and you had to jump between the rock uh, and, and the actual cliff. You couldn't hit the rock, of course, could cause major injury and you had to have some courage. You had to have uh, some sort of determination because the drop was very, very far. It was very, very deep. It's very interesting to me because uh, this past week or two, I've been watching three of uh, my little friends uh, jump off into the deep. Uh, I, I, I've been watching, if you would, Travis and, 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 and Olivia and, and, and Michael jumping off the high dive. They've been leaping off the high dive uh, uh, into the deep. No fear. 
no fear, jumping off. I, I, I'm pretty sure their parents ain't jumping off the deep, but, but, but they're not afraid. They're jumping off the highest dive uh, into the deep. And it's amazing because there's something about the deep that we just got to talk about today. This particular story finds us, if you would, Jesus having left the baptizing area, and he's now uh, made the long journey, if you would, uh, to Samaria. Uh, it's very interesting because the Bible says that he had to go. Verse 4 says he had to go through Samaria. Uh, uh, in other words, it was his decision. It was his purpose. He had every intent on going through Samaria. And Jesus makes his way to Samaria, and when he gets there, he's weary, and he's worn, and he's waning. Uh, his strength has left him. Uh, his mouth is parched. Uh, Jesus, yes, was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. Jesus got tired. He got worn. Uh, he cried. He got weary. Yes, he was divine. Yes, he was perfect, but he came to live inside of an imperfect body. And so in essence, he's worn, he's weary, his feet are dusty, and he's leaning on the side of the well. He wants something to drink, and here comes a, a Samaritan woman to come and dip water so her and her family could drink. Uh, friends, it's amazing because when we look at this particular pericope, we find uh, that Jesus uh, starts a conversation with this woman of Samaria. The woman comes to draw water and Jesus says to her, give me to drink. Now, it's very interesting because Jesus had no business talking to a woman of Samaria understand that the Samaritans were the rejected. They were the despised. Uh, how can I put it to you? Uh, uh, maybe this will help. Maybe, come on, stand up for me just one second. Uh, stand up for me just one second. Now, you had, you had in Israel, uh, remember they first asked for a king. Remember when Israel first asked for a king? God said, no, just let me be your king. And, and, and they said, no, nah, no, nah, we want a king like everybody else. We want a king that we can see. We're tired of having to just pray to the sky and not be able to see. We want to carry around a king just like everybody else around us. God warned them, and he used the prophet to warn them, to let them know that if you get a king, he's going to take your wives, he's going to take your children, he's going to take your stuff, he's going to take your horses, he's going to take your cattle, he's going to take everything from you, but if that's what you want, you can have it. Now, understand this. Come on over this side here. Don't get too close. It's COVID time. Don't get too close. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, that in essence, we had a first king, right? We had a first king who was what, everybody? Who was the first king? Saul, right? So we had Saul, right? Then after Saul, we had who? We had David, right? After David, David's son was who? Was Solomon, right? After Solomon, Solomon has a son named what? Uh, Rehoboth, right? And after that, the kingdom was divided, right? So what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, it's important to understand this because in essence, this is now the king of the northern kingdom. And you can come over here. This is now the king of the southern kingdom. Right? So now you have still an Israelite nation, but it has two kings at the same time. That's what's called the divided kingdom. When you read all the divided kingdom in Bible history or scripture, this is what it's talking about. That after Solomon, you now have two kings. The nation is divided, and now you have the northern kingdom, which is still called Israel, and you have the southern kingdom, which is now called Judah. Right? Still the same people, same ancestry, the whole nine yards. But here's the thing. When they get taken into captivity, it's the northern kingdom. In 722, the Assyrians take the northern kingdom into captivity first. These guys don't go into captivity to around 538, 539. Almost 200 years later, these guys get taken into captivity. It's during this captivity that we have characters like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're in this side. But over here, these guys get captured, and what the Assyrians did was they not just captured them, but they displaced them. So when they displaced them, they actually put them in different towns, 
and they mingle with them other captives that they have taken captive from other towns. So because of that, they're now living with people that are not Israelites, that are not Jews, that are not of their people, and now they're marrying them, they're, as they're assimilating their customs, they're changing how they eat, they're changing everything to the extent uh, that they are now considered to be a mixed multitude. They're no longer pure breeds. They are called half-breeds. The Samaritans are now despised and rejected because they have mingled with other races during captivity. Go ahead, have a seat. It's important to understand this because the Samaritans were so despised that Jews were not even supposed to speak to them. They had the same ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they had been mixed with others. Don't even speak to them. Don't have cordial conversations with them. As a matter of fact, the instructions were very clear that you are not even to accept a favor from them. Matter of fact, you should know that when Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan, there's nobody saying amen. There's no clapping. There's no praise the Lord. No, 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 no. No, no, what you mean a good Samaritan? What, what is that? That's an oxymoron to us. A good Samaritan? It's amazing because it's interesting. The only time they were allowed to deal with them is if they really needed something. Oh, Lord, help us. So if they come to town and they ain't got no food, they can go to the market and buy some food, but you don't speak or have cordial relations with the cashier. Huh? You give them your stuff, you pay your money, and you walk away. There is no cordial conversation going on. Now understand, this woman is a woman of Samaria, and she's got three strikes against her. Not only is she a Samaritan, not only is she a Samaritan, but she's a woman, and on top of that, she has a very questionable reputation. Now understand this, that in essence, these guys were not allowed to speak to the Samaritan. I'm going I'm I'm to come down your lane just for a second. In other words, it was okay to get some of their services, but it wasn't okay to mingle or befriend them. Oh, Lord help us. It was okay to eat their food, but not to mingle with them. Uh, you're going to get it in just a second. It was okay to eat their curry goat and their oxtail and their patties and, and their rice and peas, but, 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 but please go back to your own country. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Uh, um, uh, it, was, it was okay to, to, to actually partake, uh, if you would, of their roti, huh? of, their, of their seconds. It was okay to eat of that good old pumpkin soup. Uh, but, but, but please go back to your country. I said, somehow, I said, somehow we have different ancestors. <laughs> Oh, come on, Lord, help us, man. It's important to realize uh, that in essence, uh, before we condemn the Jews, uh, we need to check ourselves with our attitudes to those whom God loves. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that God loves everybody. <laughs> It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what different culture you are. And that's why in this house, you ought to know for certainty that you are loved by everybody. Yeah. Sit there and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to get that grease on, but I don't want to really associate with them. So the Jews have this problem, and Jesus could care less about their stipulations. And immediately when he sees what is considered the worst of the worst, because not only are the Samaritans the rejected and the despised, they are the low-end workers. <laughs> they are the ones who are not making a bunch of money. They are the lowest of the lowest. And their wives, that meant it was even worse. Jesus says, give me something to drink. I'm tired and I'm thirsty and I want something to drink. The woman's got some issues with him. He said, hold on a second now. Why, why are you talking to me about getting you something to drink? Here's what's interesting. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Here's what's interesting. The Jews would never speak, especially the men, would never speak to a Samaritan woman ever, ever except for one reason. 
That was if she were a prostitute. So the woman is wondering, does Jesus think she's a prostitute? Give me to drink. And the text says, the text says that she questions it. She comes, she says, no, 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 hold on a second now. Because now the disciples had gone in to buy some kosher, some kosher meat inside of Samaria. They were going to get some kosher food. Uh, and it's interesting because then said the woman, how is it that thou being a Jew ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? The Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God. He's trying to let her know right now that I'm the Messiah that your people look for. Oh, Lord, help us. In other words, although the Samaritans are this despised and rejected half-breeds, they still believe in Moses and the prophets. To the extent, understand this, when the exiles come back, when those who are taken into captivity come back and they're able to rebuild and restore, check this out, Ezra, of all people, Ezra makes a policy that there must be segregation, that there, they, there cannot be any mixing of, of Jews with Gentile or Jews with Samaritans at all. So they're not even supposed to mingle together based on Ezra's policy. It was his hope to keep a pure nation uh, uh, that would not be tainted by the mess of the Samaritans. Not just that, they were also banned from religious services. They could not go to the temple the very God that they believed in, they all believed in Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, and everybody else, but they cannot go to the temple. So the Samaritans say, forget y'all in your temple. We'll build our own temple. When put up on a different mountain, they found a text from Moses that said it should have been on this other mountain in the first place. They put their, 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 their temple up on that mountain, and they would then have this back and forth argument all the time that the Jews had their temple in the wrong place, but the Samaritans had theirs in the right place. Back and forth, they would argue. They were bitter enemies, even though they were family. It's an amazing thing because... This woman comes, and Jesus tells her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, give me the drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Ah, he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, sir, Lord help us, man. Sir, thou has nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. <laughs> this woman says, what the world are you talking about? <laughs> You're going to give me living water. You can't even get the water out of this well. <laughs> How is it that you're going to go? And she says to him that the well is deep. Now, the, the, the three charges, you know, different ones vary, but the same, what you're talking about is probably about 15 feet long enough that you can't reach it and just scoop up some water. The well is deep. She has the nerve to say this to Jesus, that the well is deep. You say, preacher, well, 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 Jesus, we know, the Bible says in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. But if you would rewind back to me to, to if you would, Genesis chapter 1 uh, and verse 1, we all know that first verse, I'm sure. The Bible says what? In the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth. Hold on a second now. Jesus is trying to remind her of something. Uh, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness uh, was upon the face <laughs> of the deep. Jesus is letting her hold on a second, woman. You don't know deep. Uh, you don't have a concept of what deep is. It's interesting to me because he starts a process, or if you would, he restarts a process that he began right in the beginning. The Bible says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
<laughs> even then, oh, Lord, help us. Even then, the waters weren't enough. Uh, the Spirit of God uh, had to move. Uh, even at Jesus' baptism, the water wasn't enough. The Spirit of God drove him into the wilderness. Even when he's talking to Nicodemus, he tells him uh, that it's not enough uh, for you to just be born. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Even when he's dealing uh, with John and, and, and John the Baptist and his disciples, he's letting them know that yes, you did water baptism, but unless a person is baptized by the Spirit, uh, they are not doing my will. It's amazing because they come at him, and it's amazing because the text says, and God said, let there be light. In this moment, in this moment, light comes to the Samaritan woman. And immediately, there was light, the Bible says. And God saw the light, that it was good, and divided the light from the darkness. <laughs> in this moment, this woman in darkness is experiencing the light. And Jesus is dividing the light from the darkness. What I love about Jesus is that in this particular text, in Genesis chapter 1, there is no sun yet and there is no moon. There are no stars. It's just light and darkness. That in essence, God can divide light from darkness. Oh, come on now. You remember when the children of Israel were crossing the Red Sea. God put a cloud that was right there and put it right in front of the enemy. So for the enemy's side, it was pitch black. You couldn't even see your fingers. But on the other side, there was fire that was shining to light the way of the Israelites as they crossed over on the Red Sea. See, God has this way of dividing darkness uh, and separating the light from the dark. Uh, and in this moment, he's doing this for this woman because she is trying to conceal and cover up her sins. It's an amazing thing because he tells this woman, you don't understand who you're talking to. You don't know nothing about deep. You don't know what deep is. Deep is when Adam was looking for a wife. And I caused a deep sleep to come upon him. <laughs> Took a rib out of his side. <laughs> and I didn't create her. According to somebody else, I built her. <laughs> Lord help us, man. Huh? <laughs> very, very interesting. That in essence, in essence, God says, that's deep. <laughs> Deep is where I cast your sins. Deep is when I broke up the fountains of the deep and killed every living thing except Noah and his family. Deep is when I formed you in your mother's womb. It's amazing because you need to understand that for us, huh, for us in Western society, even here in Bermuda, water is very important to us. In other words, if it rains really hard, we talk about it as tank filling rain. Huh? Huh? That's how we talk about it. Because water is very, very important. But the truth of the matter is, is that if hmm, the rain didn't come, we still would have access to some water. We have to pay for it, but we will have access to some water. When you live in Middle Eastern places or in Africa, water is everything. The well is everything. The well literally is a matter of life and death. If you can't get no water, you will die. There ain't no water falling. There ain't nothing to catch the water in. If you don't get to the well, you will die. What I like about this particular text is that Jesus is very thirsty, but very quickly he puts aside his own thirst to save this woman. You serve a God that even when he's thirsty and hungry, is never too thirsty or hungry that he does not pay attention to your needs. That when you needed him most here on earth, he still reached out and said, even on Calvary's cross, when he's thirsty and they come and try to give him bad stuff, his morals kicked in right away and said, I can't drink this stuff and save my people at the same time. Get that out of my face. I'd rather die thirsty uh, and save the world uh, than get up on this cross and be a drunkard. I can't do it. I must save my people. 
You need to understand that even when you're weary and even when you're tired and even when you're losing your mind on the job, understand it's at that moment that the devil will send somebody to your particular office or to your particular station to give you a hard time because he knows you're weak. That's when he sends somebody. When you're on the tip of going off, he sends somebody. Huh? And in that moment, you have to choose to either give in or be like Christ and say, I'd rather die than sin against God. It's an amazing thing because this particular story, this woman says to him, you ain't got nothing to drink to draw with. This well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Then she begs the question, art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Are you better than him? Jesus answered and said to whoso drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will be like a well spring of water, I'm sorry, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. It's important to realize that in this moment, Jesus is not saying that you will never be thirsty again. Hmm. Yeah, text says you'll never thirst again. He's not saying that you will never thirst again. What he is saying is that your thirst will change. Oh, what I'm <laughs> that there are two kinds of thirst. <laughs> there's a thirst for this well water and then there's a thirst for my water. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, and understand that when you get my water, all you do is thirst for that. You stop thirsting for this regular water, and all you want is living water. It's the same thing we see with Nicodemus, that he's letting him know you must be born of, uh, from above and not down here. He's telling the same thing to the disciples. Why? Because in essence, they have to understand uh, that his water is way better. His water produces more water. It's amazing. God, when he created the heavens and the earth, we was talking about this even last night, that in essence, he created apples. He created apples already ready to eat. Sometimes you miss this. God created what we call a mature creation. Everything was complete when he said, it is good. The trees were already at their highest height. Huh? The apples were already formed. The oranges were already on the tree. The watermelon's already on the ground. Huh? All the herbs, all the seeds, all that. And here's the thing. Not only did he make it complete, but inside of it, he put some seeds so that it could reproduce. Oh, Lord, help us, man. That in essence, in essence, you've got to understand that when God saves you, your salvation is complete. But inside of you, he's also placed some seeds so that you can reproduce. Oh, Lord, help us. So in essence, this woman, this woman is coming. She said, eh, eh, whoever gets this, you get everlasting life. The woman said unto him, give me this water. I want this water for a couple of reasons. One, I'll never be thirsty again. And two, that means I ain't got to come walking out here in this hot sun having to dip this water. Please give me this water. Hold on now. Remember, she's asking now, even though she doesn't really realize it, she's asking for water from above. She's not asking for well water. She's asking for water from above. So what does that mean? Well, in order to receive the water from above, huh, you must get right with God. Bible says if we confess our sins, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This woman is asking for that living water. Bible says in verse 16, Jesus said, go call, immediately points out her sins, go call thy husband and come thither. The woman answered very honestly, said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, you have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and he whom thou now has is not thy husband, in that thou hast said truly. What is he saying to her? Understand this. For Jews, they were only, the women were only permitted to have three husbands. <laughs> they could get divorced twice, Sister Graham. They get divorced twice, married the third time, that's it. 
After that, you need to leave marriage alone. <laughs> Clearly, it's not for you. It didn't work out. <laughs> Let it go. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. This woman has gotten married five times. She's walked down the aisle five times. Five times she said, I do, to five different men. And it didn't work out. It's interesting. The commentators say that what she actually has now as number six is like a common law husband. She got tired of walking down the aisle. <laughs> so you know what? <laughs> I'm, we're just going to call ourselves married, all right? We're just, this is how we're going to roll. We're just going to be married. That's it. And so Jesus is calling out. So the one you're with right now is not even yours. Here's what she says. The woman, this is what Ellen White says, tries to change the subject. She tries to change the subject by, by stroking his ego. She says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. What? I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then she tries some diversionary, some prevarication. She tries diversionary tactics and says, Our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Trying to divert it. Jesus brings her back. He says, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When he tells her about the hour, he's telling her about his crucifixion. He's letting her know that the hour is coming when all this stuff you're talking about won't matter. It won't matter what mountain the temple's on because the temple will no longer be relevant. She's sitting there and she's listening to him talk. The woman says unto him, I know that the Messiah is coming. She knows the language. I know the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Oh, Lord. Who you've been looking for is who you're looking at. Who you've been talking about is who you're talking to. Understand, I am he. The ego of me, the I am that I am, he's letting her know emphatically that I am the Messiah. Amazing thing because he said unto her, I am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled. They were astonished that Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. Yet nobody didn't say anything. Why seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? It's amazing. Jesus gave up taking care of his needs to reach out and save this Samaritan woman. It's an amazing thing, though, is that Jesus' spirit is infectious. Because when the woman realizes that he's the Messiah, she gives up on her needs. Oh, Lord, help us. Leaves the pot. She came thirsty too. Leaves the pot. Why? Because now she's been infected with some living water. And living water can't be kept to yourself. You've got to tell somebody what God has just done for you. She runs into the city and tells them, Come see a man who told me everything about my life. Why? Because yes, she had messed up. Yes, she had had five husbands. Yes, number six weren't really hers. Uh, but on that day, she met husband number seven, uh, the man we call Jesus Christ, and she was never the same since. Uh, Jesus uh, gave her living water, and now she could give that to everybody she ran into. I want to let you know that this woman had no clue what she was talking about when she said the well is deep. 
Because you ain't seen a well till you've seen Jesus well. And I need you to understand that whatever you need, Jesus has in the well. If you need your bills paid, he can handle that. If you need to get your children in line, he can handle that. If you need to fix your relationship, he can handle that. God's well is very deep and it never runs out of water. You've just got to be willing to be obedient to him so you can receive this water. When the woman surrendered and accepted that Jesus knew her inside and out, she was now ready to be filled with that living water. It's amazing because some of us, I don't know, we have this ability to deceive ourselves that Jesus doesn't really know the nonsense that we're doing. Yeah, yeah. We, we say it to ourselves enough. And see, the problem is that most of us in church don't know what you're doing. So you assume, yeah, Jesus don't know either. But the truth is, is that God doesn't just know what you're doing. He knows what you're thinking. Huh? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Huh? And so you've got to understand God knows all of your motives. So in other words, you guys just put offerings in church. God knows who gave sincerely and God knows who gave for appearances. God knows who gave out of the abundance of their heart and God knows who gave just to make sure that they can serve as an officer in the church. God knows your hearts. There is nothing that you can hide from him. What we're afraid of, what we're afraid of is that if he comes in, he immediately separates the light from the darkness. <laughs> what we're afraid of with that living water is that he's going to say, let there be light, and the light's going to come on and expose our nonsense. What we're afraid of is his presence in our life. Why? Because when he comes in, he immediately starts throwing out all of the nonsense that doesn't belong. Everything's got to go. And most of us would rather hold on to our nonsense than grab hold to our God. Today should be a different day, Elder Smith. Play something for me to turn, because somebody here today needs Jesus to come into their heart, to dispel the darkness, <laughs> to turn night into day, to bring deliverance. And the truth of the matter is that you can. <laughs> you can't go to heaven without being filled with God's Spirit. But you can't have his spirit while still being disobedient. So as we stand here today, as we, as we sit in our seats, it's important to realize that every Sabbath is not just an opportunity to come and praise and thank God for his goodness and grace. It's also an opportunity to say, I surrender all. I need to let go and let God. I need to give it all to him. And let him take charge. And yes, it might be painful. It might be uncomfortable. Hmm. But as we talked about in Sabbath school, yes, plowing the actual garden may be very tedious. <laughs> Having to water it every day takes a lot of consistency. <laughs> Pulling weeds, it's very irritating. But when you sit down to the table, and you cut open that watermelon that's been growing for months and you bite into it, all of the pain and suffering that it took to get it is going away. And when we get to heaven, all of the struggles 
that you're going through right now will mean absolutely nothing when we come into God's presence and we sit down at the banquet table. Jesus, having fasted for 2,000 plus years, hasn't had any bread and hasn't drank any grape juice, can sit down to the table now because he understands that the body and blood that was broken and shared for you and for me was worth it all because now we're sitting at the table. My dear brother, pass me some juice. Pass me some bread. I've waited a long time. God wants you saved. This pandemic has not come during your lifetime by chance. It's here so that you can look introspectively at yourself and determine from this day forward that I'm going to let God do what he needs to do that I might be saved. How long hold ye between two opinions? God be God. And I think it's high time that we serve him. One thing I love about the kids, when we have appeals for baptism, they readily raise their hands. Yeah, yeah. So Travis and Olivia and Mike just jumping. You know, you could do that. You ain't got no bills, you ain't got nobody to take care of. Well, just jump. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Come on, and they're up to high die too, you know, brother. Just jump. I ain't got no mortgage, please, jump. Get a little older, you're like, hey, 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 hey. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't afford to, I can't afford, can't afford to hit the wrong thing when I go down. <laughs> lose your nerve, Brian. You lose your nerve. <laughs> but it's that childlike faith that we need if we're going to be saved. <laughs> We've got to jump into the deep and let God do for us what only He can. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. I'm not going to keep you long. It's late enough. If you want to just say today, I want to stand and say, God, I'm ready to jump into the deep. I'm ready for light to come into my life to dispel the darkness. I, I, I've been trying this thing long enough and I keep failing. Everything in my life is falling apart. Everything uh, seems to be going to ruins. I need you to show up. My way is just not working. And I understand that if I'm going to have your spirit in these last days, I've got to learn to be obedient. Or oh, if that's your desire today, I want to keep you long. Just stand. Just stand to your feet. If that's you today, just stand. Just stand wherever you are. Just stand. Stand to your feet. Yeah, yeah. Stand to your feet. Sing that song that he's playing, if you would, Mike. Uh, just, just stand to your feet. I want to sing that song together. Is that all to Jesus? I said, let's, let's sing that song together. Now, many of you have stood... And we never want to overlook because we never know who's in the building. I know we got some young kids that have been desperately wanting to be baptized. So I'm going to let them raise their hands first. If you want to be baptized, then raise your hands. Their hands always go up first. Never afraid to jump into the deep. Oh, Jesus. This is somebody else. Keep your hands raised. because you, you guys are giving them encouragement to raise their hands. Is there an adult? I see you in the balcony. I see the hands in the balcony. Yes. I see you. I see you. I see you. If, 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 if there's another, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. God bless you. Yes, yes. That beautiful young lady, she came to us a few weeks ago and she wants to be baptized. God bless you, ma'am. I see your hand. Is there another? God bless you. I see one in the balcony. See another one in the balcony. Yes, yes, yes. Sister Simons, I know she's looking. She's got you. She's got you covered. But understand this. This is your moment. This is the moment of your salvation. This is the moment that God wants to change you from within. Just raise your hand. Raise your hand wherever you are. Raise your hand. I surrender all. Sing it with me, church. I surrender all. Come on now. Is there another? Is there another? Is there another? I surrender all. Yes, I see you. I see you. I see you. Yes, I see you. All to thee. All to thee. My blessed sing. I surrender all. about eyes are closed, spirit of the living God. Your people have stood. They recognize that the only thing that can really relieve the stress and the pressure that this world is placing on us right now is deliverance by the man we call Jesus Christ. 
Today, God, we need that living water. We need that water that's not just going to transform us, but will give us the fervor to go and reach and share the truth with somebody else. Lord, help us to always be willing to sacrifice our needs to build up your kingdom. Help us to always put the things of God first. Help us always to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Promise that all the things will be added unto us. We stand here in need of a savior. We stand here in need of a living God to come within us. Come inside right now. Dispel the darkness. Turn on the lights. Get to cleaning us from the inside. When the roll is called up yonder, not just us, but our families will be saved when you come. This is our prayer we pray today in Jesus' name. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Come on, somebody say amen again. God bless you. You may be seated in God's house. Actually, I'll get you to stand for our closing hymn. Thank you. <laughs> hymn number 248. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hymn 248. Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name. as we prepare to depart from this place, I just want to tell us that heaven is right there. Christ is holding his hand out. And for each of one of us, as we reach our hand out for Christ, the message was clear today. Reach your other hand back and hold on to somebody else. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we we need you. The closer we get to you, the more we need you. So Father, we want to say as a congregation today, nothing we withhold from you. Change us from the inside and from today on, make us new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Sing with us. Let the church say amen. So I should out.
are so thankful that you joined us for our services today. We had an amazing time in God's house once again. And to God be the glory for again great things he has done. I want to let you know that there are some amazing services that you can participate in and some amazing things that we provide here at the Hamilton Seventh Day Adventist Church. Uh, indeed, uh, you can participate as a young person with our Pathfinders. Uh, perhaps you didn't quite finish high school and you're ready now to take that task. You can get your high school diploma. You can earn a GED right in this place. For those of you that may be hungry, that may be short on food, feel free to come by every Wednesday afternoon. Our community services department is more than willing to give you plenty of food, a nice hot meal, and maybe some extras that you can take home and bless your family with every single Wednesday afternoon. So come on over. There's much more. We don't want to just, if you would, feed you spiritually. We also want to help with some of those temporal needs that you have in your life. So come and join us, not just on Sabbath. Come and join us during the week. We're willing to work along with Jesus Christ to do whatever it takes to make sure that your needs are not just met down here, but that one day very, very soon, you'll be ready to see Jesus when he comes into the clouds of glory. Until next time, may his peace be with you. May he watch over and protect you until you make it again into this place, into this space, whether it's virtually or in person. Just know that here at Hamilton, we love you dearly and we can't wait to worship with you again. God bless you and have a blessed and happy Sabbath. Does this work? Oh my. It works. I'm going to turn it off.